Okay, uh, so we will begin. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I was, was supposed to co-host with my very able colleague, Melanie, but uh, she she's having some problems with connection right now, but she will join us uh, hopefully in the next few minutes. And um, so let's get to it. Uh, thank you for uh, finding time and joining us today. Uh, welcome to the round table with indigenous people's representatives and allies as part of the how to indigenous governance and diplomacy for the now a webinar series uh, so uh, my name is Carson Kiburo uh, from the global indigenous youth caucus and will be your co-host today uh, this webinar series is brought to you with the support of uh, Thomas Alakchizo, who is here today with us, and Joseph, uh, Drumbit Media, and TV, uh, TV Indigena. And we could not do this without our amazing interpreters from Joseph and, of course, other uh, great friends. Uh, this episode is a virtual roundtable to build on the one-on-one -on -one conversations of the previous uh, five episodes by the uh, I mean, by represent, presenting thoughtful, informative texts on the state of indigenous diplomacy and governance today. Uh, if you have been uh, the previous episodes, uh, go to YouTube and search for hashtag how to indigenous now, and you will find the full episodes and the one on one conversations. If you are participating, participating in the Zoom and watching on the Facebook live stream, please uh, let us know in the comments where you're watching from. Uh, for those that are watching on Zoom, and question the question answer, the Q&A feature is active, meaning that uh, throughout the episode, you can ask questions for our guests to answer. And so, uh, quickly, uh, we're going to share some quick things with you. Uh, the webinar series will be recorded and repurposed uh, for the Gomaluku podcast. That is at Gomaluku. And please engage with each other in this conversation through the chat and comments. Uh, let each other know what your answer would be to a question. And if you have had a good quote, uh, that is to our panelists, uh, please help us um, keep the conversation going on Twitter. And um, use the hashtag how to indigenous now and you can tag the sally in your post at gomaluku uh, feel free to share any of the questions uh, screenshots or feedback if you have joined us via zoom as well interpretation is uh, available today for spanish french and russian is provided by our partner um Dose. And for this episode, we will also have an interpretation in Chinese. Uh, currently, uh, right in this minute, uh, Chinese interpretation is, is being fixed uh, by our friend uh, Lai Yu Kev and Leonard Chien. Uh, for our guests today, please speak at a normal pace uh, so that our interpreters can follow and put uh, yourself on mute when you're not talking. And Yes, I am joined by Ghazali Orella, Raja Devashish Roy, uh, Grim Reed, uh, Maithin Yumon, Maina Talia, uh, Megan Davis, uh, Ruka uh, Samaligi, and uh, Claire Chatters, uh, Jocelyn Ting Hui Hung Chen, uh, Binoto Moi Tamai, Hunanatu Matoke, and Thomas Aslak Chuzo. Uh, let's, dive right, uh, let's dive right into the first question, and I'll throw this one to Gasali. Everyone will answer this question anyway. Uh, finish the sentence. I do what I do because... Gasali, please. Um, I do what I do because um, I like to inspire and empower Indigenous peoples so that they can do what inspires them. Wow. All right, let's get to who are present in this call as well. Uh, who's, go, who's going next for our co-hosts? I mean, for our panelists. Should, should I just I pass do, on the mic? Yeah, pass on. Yeah. Thank you so much. Pass on the mic. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Um, I'll, I'll pass it on to uh, Tomas. Tomas. Let's do this. Okay, I was surprised. Okay, so last week I answered something, so today I'm going to answer something different. So <laughs> I do what I do because um, it's important to uh, push for the indigenous issues on the national level. Wow, uh, Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, would you like to pass the mic or... Uh, we should just let, let it open now. Uh, I can give it to Jocelyn. Good. Jocelyn, can you hear us? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, loud, loud and clear. Okay, thanks. All right, so I do what I do because I don't want the next generation have to suffer from the same issues or challenges that we are facing now. Wonderful. Would you like to pass the mic or should I pick someone? <laughs> now I see Devisish. Good. Dave. Thank you, Jocelyn. I'll give you a few. I do what I do because, well, I think I could be wrong is the right thing to do for my people in this current circumstances. I think my people expect me to do something about that. And of course I have shortcomings and limitations, but I, I think I'm better equipped to play a role in this context than most, many others. They may be many better than me, but so I think, thanks. That is wonderful. Would you like to pass the mic, Dave? If you know anyone here. I see you had a conversation with one of our co one of your co-panelists. All right, let me pick uh, uh, Pro Play Professor Charters? Megan. Sorry. All right. Uh, uh, I, I uh, said Claire Charters, Doctor Claire Charters. Oh, Claire, Claire, oh, Claire, Claire, Megan, Doctor Megan, too. Welcome. <laughs> All right, so let's go with Claire first. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, lovely to see everybody and Honey, nice to see you um, over there in, our, in Aotearoa and um, nice to see you come on Megan. I was just saying before that um, we we're already on a webinar today or, um, and so this is our second time so it's nice to see you again. Um, I do what I do because my nana told me to do it. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> In, in a way, I mean, I think that's I think that's true. In a way, I think um, we all come at this work with a um, with our with our ancestors behind us, um, and with carrying on uh, mahi that or work that was started many many centuries in some cases um, before we ended up here. And so, I think we're just continuing on the the mahi and hopefully the work, and then hopefully. I think our next generations will continue on also, but it's something that, that it's, not, it's not necessarily by choice, <laughs> although I gladly and have had the most um, exciting and wonderful times in this work, but it's, it's um, also because that's, that's who you are and it's um, where your people are at and it's, um, yeah, where, where you're expected to be as well. Um, wow, amazing. So, is, so Megan is here? Hello, Or not? Claire. No, Megan, Megan's not here. Okay, well, I then, yes. I can't, I can't see passing. anyone else's faces, so I'll hand over to, I can't see anyone else who's, I'm, I'm not sure who else is here, I'm sorry, Carson, so I'll let you. No, no, uh, no, no, no worries. And thank you for letting, I mean, clarifying that Megan is not here. Uh, let me just say that I confused you with Megan before I checked the names before, <laughs> I mean the voice before I, I saw you in the face. I'm sorry for that. Uh, yeah, so. No um, problem, what an honor. That's a big honor for me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think next is uh, Benata. Uh, do we have uh, Benata online? So, um, Carson, if I may, uh, you still have Mina with us. Um, he, he's with us. He's uh, watching his uh, 
youngest uh, play footy right now. Um, um, Binota might seen uh, they had a meeting with AIPP like last minute, so they could, could not join. And Megan is uh, joining us in, in, a couple, in a couple of minutes. Great. So uh, thank you so much, Gasali. Um, so we have, I, I think we should pick Una. Una should be in. Una, um, why are you doing this? Just like, uh, I do what I do because uh, I want you to answer that question, Una. Um, mm, all right. So, it, oh, good. Is it me, Ghazali? <clears throat> oh, why not? My name is him. Um, oh, yeah. Um, Mina, welcome to the welcome to the call uh we were just uh, uh going to the first question uh finish the sentence i do what i do because okay thank you yeah uh, i do what i do to ensure the um survival and the continuity and the survival of our people as a community thank you thank you sir Thank you so much, Maina, and uh, it's a blessing to have you online today in this conversation. We're waiting for you. Um, so, uh, 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 Una, do we have you online? Uh, uh, sorry that I can't check on my phone because uh, my laptop has all misbehaved the last minute. And I cannot check who is online and who is not online. Um, hmm. So, uh, okay, let's, um, let's dive into the next question. Uh, oh, Huna, Huna, if you can hear me, I can see you. If you can hear me, uh, please um, answer the question. I do what I do because... Yeah, you are muted. Please unmute your mic. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Do you mean me? Oh, oh okay. okay, it's breaking, but sorry, we can, all right, we it's can hear you now. Clear. It's not clear, sorry. Okay, so I do what I do because I don't want to lose my uh, uh, culture and I don't want to the next generation to be suffering. Thank you Thank so you. much, Pona. Um, yes, uh, so uh, good. Uh, now that we have all around, um, our panelists have answered the questions, uh, I mean the first question. Uh, let's go directly to um, the next question would be, um, okay, uh, I, I, it's sort of that my thoughts are not well planned right now because uh, my colleague just had issues connecting and um, I'm just going to pick where she was supposed to do. So good. So what do we like to hear uh, to our able panelists today? What do we like to hear about um, indigenous diplomacy and governance? I would like to go first. Car um, Carson, if I may. Yes. Um, like I, I think, like to re really dive deep into um, the, the whole conversation about um, indigenous governance and diplomacy, um, as it is this webinar's purpose. Um, I think what what we've been uh, talking about for the last five, six episodes, actually, is like where we are as an as, as a movement, um, where we want to go as a movement, as an international Indian people's movement, and how we want to get there. Um, so like, I, I'm, I'm wondering what um, our, our colleagues think, of what, what, is, what is the number one thing that you are working right now or are thinking about? Um, I, I think that would be like a, um, a a good start. Um, yeah. Yeah. To to kick off, like, what are we working on? Uh, what are you What are you thinking about right now when it comes to indigenous peoples? Uh, 
Thank you for making it so much clear. And I knew I could use your help, Kasale. Thank you so much. And yeah, let's go directly to that question. Um, where are we now in this movement, indigenous movement? Uh, Thomas, would you be ready to go first? Well, uh, thank you, Anna. I, I, I guess I can try the uh, a, a bit open the, the the discussion to to um, to to flow in a in a natural natural way. I, I think it's an important uh, um, to to realize that. The, uh, the right to self determination is a is a complex, deep right for the indigenous peoples, and it does um, include the the nature of representation of of of, of a people. And I think that is something that I have been talking quite a much that uh, that um, the efforts of a collective uh, collective groups are are um, allowing us to. To, to to be in positions where where our voices are heard more strongly but it does though mean also that you 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 can also um and have to have to um, make the decision of of how you are uh, desiring your um, your future to be built as a, as a, as a group as a people and i think that is also an interesting and crucial question that how do we in in different situations different peoples uh, are, are are doing that and i'm most interested to hear some of the examples and 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 and, and, um, and um, experts that we have here uh, on, on 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 those issues and, and and levels and so so um i would maybe push the question first to the dev, dev. That is really interesting to me that um, that um, that uh, in their uh, peoples they have traditional institution they have uh, uh, customary laws they are practicing them that is really strong and sometimes I as a, as a, as a, uh, a leader of a, of a some parliament do to desire the 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 practical customary laws to be more enforcing here. And, and I think that is a, a pretty interesting um, a form of, of self-determination that they have in, in, in Bangladesh. So maybe I would kind of pass the question to, to, to Dev firstly. Wow, Dev, please. Uh, thanks, Thomas. And it's actually been my honor and pleasure to see you, Thomas, from the permanent forum to now in the Sami parliament, giving a dynamic leadership. Uh, we all, in, uh, so many of you inspire me. Well, uh, I will try to give an example of the international level, where we are and where we want to be. And then also speak from my own experience, from my people, where we went through two plus decades of guerrilla warfare between our guerrillas and the military uh, peace accord, so-called peace accord, and which is not going anywhere. But uh, firstly, I'll speak with our people, uh, but at least in certain spheres, actually, we do. Funnily enough, in a country like Bangladesh, which is not federal, it's unitary, we are hardly two to three percent of the population of the country, except in my region, and uh, where we exercise self-determination clearly, at least in one aspect, which is our personal laws, our inheritance, marriage, divorce, child custody. The state has not interfered with us since British times. Pakistan to Bangladesh time. So I had a tribal court uh, in my territory. There are two other uh, chiefs like me. And there actually, on the one hand, having self-determination means you can do whatever you want. So what do you do? You can even have the freedom 
I would not call it a right, to exclude the women from inheritance on land rights, to allow polygyny, man having more than one wife, to continue uh, indefinitely. And as regards, say, child rights, who will win the custody of a child if there's a divorce and so forth and all that, women's rights. So I think this is where actually we have to really learn that had we had self-determination in other spheres, which we haven't got, for example, total self-governments, total legislative powers in spheres other than customary personal law, in land and forest laws and all that, would we be exercising a self-determination in a responsible manner? And remember that what the UN Declaration said that our indigenous people's rights must not go below the standards of international human rights law, which includes the rights of women, which includes the rights of children, includes the rights of persons with disabilities and other disadvantaged groups. So I think the lesson that I is that has to exercise rights at the same time have responsibilities. You do it with wisdom which we borrow from our, uh, uh, our elders and our generations. But on the other hand, uh, how do we fit self-determination and self-governance into other spheres in a territorial and non-territorial units you may have within your state that we are a non-federal state. But I'll just get into the international sphere and end there. They've been going on too long. That at the international level, where we want to reach is that we are self-determining peoples which the United Nations recognizes if not at the same level of the state, but as a non-state people, we are a nation. Any other nations is about nations and not about states. That's where it started from, League of Nations and so on and so forth, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the UN Charter and so forth. And in the intermediate level, what we wished to was to have seats, including at the General Assembly. And that, that Claire was there, made a very strong leading role with states representatives to have the UN uh, open up from the General Assembly, etc., so that we have our voices heard along with the states at the UN levels. And then, of course, also at other international levels where things are better than they used to be. We still have problems with the World Bank and the international financial institutions, the climate change process. But I think we have come a long, long way since the 1980s when the Kobo did that huge study on discrimination against indigenous peoples. So I try to connect between the international and the local, but I'm much more local and national, sometimes national now than I used to be when I was in the forum, the working group on draft declaration and other spheres. Thanks, Carson. But, uh, Thomas, thank like, you I, so I, much. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, Ghazali, uh, let me just say something. Uh, um, to our panelists and our listeners today. Uh, Gasali is joining me as my co-host. So please, Gasali, you're, you're going to be co-host as well as um, a panelist. So clearly you have a lot on your table today. Uh, please carry, uh, come on board again. No, no, I'm, um, uh, th thank you, Carson. I just, uh, I think I, I... A, a question for for because um, hearing what what Dev said and uh, like connecting the international with the national um, how and then playing the ball back to Thomas like how 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 do you see it and how would you how would you like to see it? Uh, that that is a good question and uh, um, I think that there is a, a clearly a global um, not only kind of right based approach but generous call for for um, uh, to be um, recognizing the indigenous peoples to be part of the for example the united nations work and uh, and um, i think that um what what one thing that i have been i have been uh, trying to push and and think that is important that that uh, Maybe a little bit outside from the from the negotiation process that are ongoing in the United Nations, where where indigenous peoples are are trying to push for a recognition and and an opportunity to be participating in the decision making processes that the General Assembly uh, level has, 
is 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 the, is the issue that um i think it's an, it's it's important to remember that indigenous peoples are living in different realities there are different for, forms of 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 um self governments or 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 expressions of of uh, of our right to to self determination and and uh, taking into account the different uh, different um uh, aspects that we have the world is 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 crucial and how we can strengthen that approach currently is, is something that i i think it's important um maybe some of the listeners know that the the negotiation process in the united nations with the enhanced participation process has been uh, participated by not so many indigenous peoples maybe even uh, mainly by two regions or three regions and and i think that that is a that is um if we think about the the state of the of the indigenous peoples global movement within this process i think that that is something that um uh, uh it's important to address we have started to address it a bit i think that uh, the information is 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 uh, being shared more there are more uh, um um let's say uh, um attempt to 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 secure uh, participation of other other peoples to this process for example from my and the sami side and and i think that is that is uh, an, an an important element where we are thinking that how those forms of uh, of 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 expressions of self determination can be taken on board in the united nations and in the talks there but there are you know a lot of different practical problems and realities and even within us as coming from the nordics being recognized by by the constitutions in in all of the nordic countries being uh, uh developed and given the the right to have a, a self government uh, institutions like the sami parliaments and though with limited limited resources we still are struggling to participate in the united nations we cannot even register ourselves directly to the united nations meetings there are only two levels of of participation that we can do and those are under the permanent forum and then the emrip where we can uh, come up come up with the indigenous peoples organization whether that is even correct to us i'm i'm, I'm not even sure on, on that but but at least it allows us to register as a, as our own uh, but then thinking about all the other processes where have been participating heavily the human rights council the the unfccc the cpd processes we cannot even participate so we are forced uh, within the current format to participate with the government in government delegation if they are willing to take us in 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 the delegation and in the delegation it's in not even uh, that easy to 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 participate uh, when when um the let's say the positions might differ quite a lot with the government so our meaningful participation actually is a bit limited although i understand that this point is coming from a, a um uh, area in the world where 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 uh, the recognition of indigenous peoples have been done uh, uh, quite openly already and been enforced for a long time but i think that that is that is the kind of my approach of the of the state of the indigenous peoples within the enhanced part of process and i'm so mm, aspired uh, although i have known a lot of the forms of 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 um uh, uh, of of self determination um, among other regions or other places and so asp aspired by by other institutions i think that many people might take a little mistake of thinking the sami parliament as the overall global best practices but i think that there are really good practices in other places where actually the 
the form of self-government is, is in place. Even in, 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 in the case of, of, of Russia, I think that that is, the, the, the Dev's example is a, is a, is a really interesting and, and, and example on, on where the governments may be in a different dynamics and where the history might be a bit different than in here. And still there are, are clear uh, examples and forms of, 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 of self-determination in practice. We have some examples in Kuna land where they actually manage the land themselves and they have the full power of doing that. So, 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 so I'm really aspired by the discussion we are having and it's important to have it also. Thanks, uh, uh, um, Thomas. Um, we talked about participation, um, enhanced participation as well. And thank, uh, I'm very thankful for Claire to be for being with us um, because she can elaborate more about the, on that. Um, I think when you start, first started talking about participation, I started thinking or like looking at Jocelyn because uh, um, there are different kinds of participation. Um, there are different challenges in terms of participation. And for, for a situation like for the peoples of Taiwan, for example, um, Jocelyn, if you can, or if you will, of course, uh, like what are challenges are you facing um, so that people know for as a, as a Taiwanese indigenous representative at the United Nations? And we talked about enhanced participation. I know you're interested. Um, maybe you can explain a little bit why the enhanced particip participation process is interesting to you. Okay, so <laughs> since we have Chinese interpretation today, I'm going to use this advantage. And so I'll, I'll try to first <laughs> speak in Chinese and see how they work, okay? Okay, 那对于台湾或者是就是, uh, uh, so very basically, it's actually very difficult for us to even step inside the building of the United Nations for, to participate in anything, let alone register for any conferences. For example, if you are registering for certain conferences, you can't register as yourself, you have to register as a form of the government. But for Taiwan indigenous peoples, we can't even register, not as ourselves or as the government, we can't even visit the United Nations building because the passport of Taiwan is not recognized by the United Nations. And I think I've talked about this before, once when I was um, at a United Nations for a meeting and I was holding my Taiwan passport and the person from the registration desk just threw my passport aside and said, this is not a recognized and not a viable passport because Taiwan does not exist within the United Nations. So that is the most direct challenge we are facing today. And in addition to this, so this participation is difficult enough for us to even enter the building to participate in conferences. But despite that, I still insist on participating in conferences in the United Nations because we don't have a permanent delegation in the United Nations. We are unable to participate in the various conferences and meetings. And this is all related to the sustainable and long-term development of nations we get second-hand, third-hand, and even selected information, digested information. We never get really direct information. So through these um, second-hand, third-hand, and selected information, some of the information that were actually really important to us and essential to us, or meaningful to us, are selected out. For example, sustainable development in the 17, Article 17, it's, there are main three pillars, including society, environment, and social political 
but in Taiwan, we only talk about more about the environment in terms of sustainable development because all the information we gain, unless people really do more research on their own, the, the picture that the government paints regarding sustainable development is more towards the environment and environmental protection. So we know that this is important, but social reform and a political environment reform is even more important. How can these reforms respond to the requirements of environmental protection? Which is why when Ghazali asked me, asked me this question, uh, uh, do we really care about how are uh, there other ways for us to participate in the United Nations? Because this is important to us. After we come back to Taiwan, people who join conferences in the United Nations, they come back to Taiwan and people question them, why are you going there? What's in it for you? What's in it for, United, for the people, the United sorry, for the indigenous peoples of Taiwan, what are the direct benefits? Yes, there are no short-term benefits. It's very difficult to really just bring the force of United Nations straight into Taiwan, but at least long-term, we can see what everybody is talking about internationally. And coming back to Taiwan on a national level, we can see how we can translate that back to what we do in Taiwan. So for example, when we talk about self-government, of indigenous peoples. It seems like an ultimate goal, but based on my experiences at the United Nations, we know that it's actually a rolling experience. It's not an ultimate goal. It may grow into different shapes as it rolls, as it develops. And with, it will adapt to different indigenous peoples. But our discussions in Taiwan are very fragmented. And I think that is a real pity. So our experiences at the United Nations can be brought back to Taiwan, however minor, at least we can start doing some rolling management in our own indigenous villages. We may only have five people and 10 people, but at least we can start and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Um, I have to wait un until like the interpretation um, sure. for, for a while, of course. Um, thank you so much, much for, giving, for giving that point of view, because I, I remember um, that always uh, Taiwan and these people from Taiwan having a challenge participating at, at the United Nations. Um, what uh, um, let, let's let, let's I, I wouldn't say abuse. Let's make use of the of having um um claire with us um uh, because we it has been touched upon um through for every everyone already and like the previous um the webinar episode as well the enhanced participation process claire you've been uh, advisor to the president of the general assembly um for for that process um we already talked a bit all about where it is right now uh but i think now more importantly uh, is where do you would like to see it go and how, and in terms of these people's participation, what is lacking and what are the opportunities? Um all uh, self-determining peoples to have um, a voice at the General Assembly and throughout the United Nations as equals. Um, so that's where I would like to see it go. Um, what, what are some of the issues that I think are happening within the, I guess, the Indigenous movement? Um, I think there's, there's, there's lots of issues. I mean, one is, is simply that some for some indigenous people seeking um, something equivalent to 
um, sovereignty and statehood or, or recognition that Indigenous peoples have um, wrongfully been excluded from recognition of statehood or sovereignty um, is, important, is more important for some Indigenous than others at the moment. Um, and that's always the case. There's always that um, there's always multiple dynamics or, or hundreds of dynamics, not just multiple, uh, thousands of dynamics at play. And, and um, usually the domestic imperatives will always drive what's happening for each Indigenous peoples at the um, international level. And by domestic, I mean, I guess, the local. Um, and for some Indigenous peoples, that's not the most pressing thing right now, right? And, and um, and that's that's as it as it should be. Um, however, I do think that um, the logical next step in the in in the indigenous movement is is obviously recognition of um, indigenous peoples as peoples, um, and that means equal participation alongside other representatives of peoples. So, including states and places like the Gen and General Assembly. And I think that that. Um, that recognition when it when it when it happens or, or or the process to achieving that is really important um, domestically um, as well because it will push along so many of our different kaupapa or our our objectives there as well. So the two the, what what's happening internationally internationally what's happening domestically works synergistically, I guess. Um, so I I hope that. Um, all Indigenous peoples can see the value in that and I hope that at some magical point in time we'll all be relatively or enough aligned um, that that push will become strong enough to push it over the line. At the moment I don't feel that, or up until this point at least, I'm not sure that we... Uh, yes, you... But that's true of any political process that you sometimes just have to wait till the stars align and everyone's on the right page or on the same page for that particular um, part of the puzzle to be to, to fall into place right and one thing that we've got for going for us which states don't have going for them i guess is that we're always going to be demanding this this is not going to go away <laughs> we're always going to be seeking this ultimate objective in one form or another we might wax and wane about our priorities in different times and what we're prioritizing, but we're still going to be there um, seeking this. Whereas states, will, their politics might change, they might go up and down, but we'll always be there. At some stage, I've come to think that we just outlast um, the states in some ways and we continue and eventually we, we shift enough minds and you have youth and people coming through that, that, you, that you get somewhere there. Um, did that, there was a third question in there, Ghazali. Sorry, I've forgotten it and getting caught up in that discussion. Or was, or was there a third question in there? Um, I'm sorry, I was listening to so closely that I forgot oh, sorry, my question what, as well. Um, <laughs> it was about what we wanted to, what, what, what I wanted, thought we could achieve and then what, what the Indigenous movement could come. There was, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the, the third no, question. I, I th well, I, th I think you pretty much covered it, uh, um, at least what it, the, the, uh, answering the questions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I've got some answers to, or I've got some, some I, I've got some things that that I could say about um, what's what are my priorities. But I mean, it might be worth just sticking on this issue for a little bit longer. I'm not sure. Oh, the conversation is like it's free to go anywhere you you would like, of course. So um, I, I would say, like, while you have the floor, uh, please um, well, share what you would like to. Um, well, I mean, I, I don't know. That's that's that's. I think my my internet connection. I think sticking with this topic um, for a bit for a bit longer. I'd be really interested in um, because it it was a hard it was a hard um, run in the general assembly in you know two thousand sixteen two thousand seventeen and ongoing in these past years as well. I would really like to get a sense of. To what extent is it a priority? Is this, I mean, we're dealing with unprecedented, well, we're always dealing with unprecedented circumstances, but COVID obviously changes the, the, the practicality of trying to have an international movement um, around a particular issue. 
um, but there might be there might be real um, and I and I keep thinking this there might be real advantages for us in this like that we could get some movement if we're really savvy um, working remotely um, on this particular issue so that when when everything starts up again at the UN if we're ready and we've got a draft resolution to put before the GA and we capitalize on on I mean I know this is a live thing but you know this is a public space but you know I think there are there are opportunities and, and moments that we must use and I'd be interested in people's um, level of um, enthusiasm for that but also what opportunities you might see for movement now Um, thanks, Claire. It will, um, looking at uh, particularly well, all the panelists, of course. Um, I don't want to. If if everyone, everyone, if someone wants to like jump in right now, I have have some views to to sh to share on the on this issue. But I see Thomas and and Dev um, as well. Uh, recognize Mina, Huna. Um, maybe you would like to go first on uh, on um, sharing your views uh, for for the NS participation process. Or like, sorry. Uh, class question. I don't see I don't see anyone um, like jumping. So I'll um, up and down. Um, so at least for firm and speaking from uh, like the council that like Huna is the head of the uh, the Alifuru Council. Um, obviously, she, she can talk more about that, um, but she pretty much delegated me to be. Um, uh, yeah, taking points on the NS participation process. Um, it's a high priority, uh, for, for at least for, for the uh, IFRU Council. Um, we did see some challenges, uh, of course, um, uh, to participate in the negotiations. One, of course, is the monetary challenge of being in New York um, uh, from the islands and, and being able to participate in the negotiations. That's one, one challenge. Um, luckily, with well, luckily, uh, quote unquote, luckily with COVID-19, we can um, yeah, make use of the, the opportunities that we have to strategize more, um, share more thoughts, uh, how the region, how the Pacific region is on, on, the, on the NS participation process and Indigenous peoples at large. Um, and there is also what, at least in, in, in my view, um, it is, a avenue that, um, like you said, is ex exciting as in like it is a huge opportunity for Indigenous peoples um, representative institutions. And what I do see is, is that there's a, a minor, and it's just my point of view, minor level of confusion is that uh, some people uh, are confused with an aspect participation of Indigenous organizations or Indigenous peoples organizations. Um, that that is the NS participation process, um, and whereas it is, we're, we're talking about the the government representative institutions, so parliaments, um, assemblies, uh, councils, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so did I maybe to to like to run ahead of your question as well is that um, I see that there's not enough. Uh, attention to the to the process, um, and I think that, that we could do a lot more as a movement to um, uh, build the capacities of Indigenous peoples um, awareness around the issue, um, so that people are more uh, in tune and and uh, aware of of the process because it is definitely a, a very a huge opportunity for Indigenous peoples, um, and I hope that a lot of people Indigenous peoples. Um, realize that. Um, so th those are just my quick, my, my, my quick, quick thoughts on that. I would love to hear uh, everyone else uh, is their thoughts on that as well. Well, I will jump in on this also. I think those are those were really valid comments, and and they are shared by me in many many ways. Um, I think that um, the understanding of urgency is some something that is is also a little bit missing uh, in the in the movement. I think that um, there is a, a 
a lot of trust, what is of course a good thing also um, for for um, certain institutions or certain peoples to push the uh, issue forward. But I do think though that that in order to be successful, we need um, strong participation from all seven regions. Um, not just only, only kind of participating in the meetings, but actually uh, engaging in the in the informal planning sessions and, and so forth. Of course, how do we do that is 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 a question, and I think that um, the establishment of a, of a, of a coordination body has been a, a a step to right direction. I think that, and 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 for us to be bluntly honest has been a, a really a, a important criteria to continue in this process. Because uh, um, uh, in order to be successful, we need multiple fronts to be pushed. We need the we need the numbers on on discussing with the member states uh, coming from all of the all of the regions. It's not enough that that uh, we, for example, here are speaking to the Nordic countries of Finland, Sweden, Norway, maybe even Denmark uh, and Canada together with Inuits. It, it, it does not allow the, the room to have the willingness to accept uh, indigenous recognition and, 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 and then rules of, of engagement uh, in the GA level. So, so I think that is a, a crucial, crucial part. I think that we are moving to that direction, but, but I think that, that we need still more engagement and commitment to this process. And, and of course, it's always a question of those uh, on the matter who are willing to participate in this. This is not a process that can be forced to anybody. Of course not, uh, and not any of the processes can be done so. But, but I, I think that the level of engagement from all of the regions are, are, are pretty important. Also because of strategical point. Uh, it's always been a strength in the indigenous movement that that uh, people of those regions, those countries where they live, they of course know the best of political climate, they know the diplomatical climate, they know how make a move in those bases, uh, uh, what are there for us. And, and it's most impossible to try to move in those bases uh, from other regions or, 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 or kind of um, not having the knowledges and, and, and not having the, the, the current exact political climates in, 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 in known. So I think that those aspects are really important and how do we strengthen our process. But the process is ongoing, the process is moving forward. The General Assembly has decided that in the 75th session they would have to restart the uh, at least discussions on the process uh, whether that means a negotiation pro process during the 75th session or not it's it's a question for us also how do we see the process um, there has been now an idea floated that um, the indigenous movement and also because of the COVID situation is not prepared to 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 negotiate during the 75th session so, so in order to allow us the best uh, possible opportunities to strategize, be ready and, and be able to participate, I think that the movement of the process by year or two would be important. But, the, but in, even, in, even be able to do that, we would have to have a clear roadmap in our sense. Because I do sense in some of my discussions with them, um, some of the member states that I have been doing, uh, I, I, I do see that there is a, there is a, uh, a need for, for uh, guidance for also the them, how do we see the process? And I think this is a really crucial, let's say half a year uh, forward, how the process is moving forward. Because without a pretty clear roadmap from the indigenous movement, some of our friends in the United Nations are in a difficult position to, to support our, our needs. 
uh, I'm ready if if people are <laughs> uh, have have the space. This is Devashish, Dev. Yeah. Uh, I I I can't hear you, but can you hear yes. me? Please, we can right. continue. Well, uh, I go back to some of the things Claire dealt with. Uh, for example, indigenous peoples' participation, uh, substantive participation of the UN uh, from the highest levels. Well, let's say the UN General Assembly. Uh, also, also, the UN is not the General Assembly only. There are the councils, there's ECOSOC, there's Human Rights Council, there are the agencies. Now, I think that we need to do our homework, which does not in any way, you know, undermine our right to be at the highest levels as of now or when we started demanding it. But we've got to be prepared. So what I'm basically saying is two things. One is that the UN is not a monolithic entity. It's a very, very complex organization with the New York bodies, General Assembly and ECOSOC, uh, Security Council to the, if I call it the Geneva bodies, Human Rights Council and others to the agencies at the central levels and in the country levels. And so, for example, assume for the sake of argument that we have an observer seat, for example, at the United, at the General Assembly level. And now, how do we influence the other members of the council? Just imagine also the challenges of small countries, developing countries, which have a skeleton scarf of two, the ambassador, the permanent representative, and one third secretary or somebody in a skeleton staff in New York or Geneva, trying to lobby the group of 77 in China, the G7, uh, blah, 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 to push their line, even being a state. And that's where I think, I don't know, it was Les Malizer and some of those, we're talking about, or even a Alaskan friend, an embassy, indigenous embassy in Geneva, indigenous embassy in New York, uh, I don't know, in, in, in Vienna, Strasbourg. Why not? Because lobbying is something that has to be done consistently in a very sustained manner. You know, when we work for uh, Claire, you know, Thomas, you were there, Ghazali, you were there lobbying for the, for, the, for the World Conference of Indigenous Peoples, how we lobbied those people. And there we found out that, hey, the same person from this certain embassy is both at the GA and, and Fifth Committee or whichever committee of the General Assembly at ECOSOC, because they happen to be New York, which is different from the Geneva dynamics. So I think Indigenous Peoples ought to start preparing if we were given that seat in the general state, even as an observer, a right, uh, well, not a right of reply, but certain rights, akin, similar to what states have in the assembly, in the councils, but also, also, what about the UN agencies? EFAD has opened up as a good practice, yeah? So we, you, you, indigenous peoples get a chance to talk to the I forget the structure now, the Board of Governors or whatever it is, like FEO has its own structure, EFAD has its own, UNICEF has its own. But we also have to learn to understand the dynamics of those agencies so that we can influence. Um, well, finally, hopefully we have a seat on the high chair or the high table. <laughs> but until then also, we learn the ropes of how to influence at the headquarters level and now I want to end in, in, in this brief uh, point I'm trying to make is at the country level. Sometimes the headquarter level and the country level don't even understand each other. And then at the regional bodies, for example, you know, uh, Asia, it, it has uh, FAO has a very high, UNDP has a regional presence, etc. Africa has its own, for example, environment related. Uh, for example, UNEP is in 
in, 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 in Kenya, Nairobi. So these are also the dynamics where we have to learn and also ask the UN to change itself because the UN doesn't sometimes follow its own rules. Uh, the Secretary General's uh, documents sometimes lie on some cupboard with the resident coordinator and the, uh, and the country director of the UN, UNDP, etc. So uh, I am not at the least questioning our right to be there at the highest level, but I'm also saying that we have to build our capacities and also learn how we can work on, in a regional manner, an other manner, at the headquarters in New York, in Geneva, in Washington, DC, and elsewhere, in London, Paris, where we can make an impact to change things happen from climate change to others in the way that we want, indigenous people want, and if we can demonstrate that it's a win-win situation, that indigenous win, the rest don't lose, but the world wins as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Raja. I don't know if I'm audible or not. Good. So, uh, good to be back uh, with it. I had problems with my audio as well. Raja, can you hear us? Raja, Raja seems all right. Good. Um, oh, so, Lord and care, Carson. Okay, so we would like to thank you for your thoughts. I would like to welcome Roka, who has just joined us. Uh, welcome. Um, and uh, I would like to ask a question to Maina. Uh, what, what What do you think about indigenous participation? After uh, I mean, uh, you like. Um, we could talk about the participation and your efforts uh, to uh, to value uh, nation to uh, uh, to include indigenous rights in uh, in that advocacy uh, of, uh, in what you do. I don't know, Maina, yeah, did you hear me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> first of all, thank you so much, uh, Carson, for the uh, question. Basically, we. Um, Tuvalu is just a very small island and with a population of around 10,000 people. So our participation within the UN system, especially in terms of um, indigenous rights, it's very limited. Given our remoteness and especially the resources that we have to participate, it's quite very far away from Geneva. quite far from Geneva and New York as well. So resources is one of the problems, the challenges that we are facing. But given the fact that we have to raise our concern at the international plane, we have done so much advocacy uh, in Geneva and also in New York, especially to incorporate the um, indigenous rights into our uh, uh, regional and especially uh, local um, initiatives as well. So we are in collaboration with the government, even the past government, we are trying to lobby for, uh, for the government of Tuvalu to, to ratify the um, uh, UN DRIP as part of our advocacy plan as well. So, that's part of our plan. I mean, we've, we've been communicating with them as well. We've been writing to them. And I think it's just a matter of um, doing some formal uh, discussion and find a way forward, you know, because it's going to be uh, a, a big step for us as well. But I don't see any uh, a problem with that. But apart from that, we are, we, we, we are seeing some very progressive uh, efforts by this new government uh, in terms of the uh, finalizing the uh, Tuvalu uh, foreign policy. And within that foreign policy, they have been doing some very um, uh, fundamental consultations with our elders, 
in terms of uh, bringing in the indigenous aspect of things, how can we uh, bring that international, I mean, the uh, indigenous wisdom into the international plane where the diplomat sits and how best we can utilize, utilize our own values, our traditional values at that, at that platform. So I, I can see some very uh, good progressive by this new government in terms of uh, bringing in the uh, aspect of indigenous knowledge and our traditional values. So, so far, I think we, we're doing our work, our homework as well not just at the international arena, but we are also lobbying our, our politicians to, to, to bring that very interesting um, aspect of indigenous wisdom. You know, it's something that we've been living in the, in the past years, but it's just a matter of uh, how best we can utilize that knowledge at different platforms. So, Carson, I hope I'm answering your question, and that's my contribution for tonight. Yeah. But it's good that I'm learning from you yeah, guys. Yes. <laughs> thank you. And Maino, before I let you go, and thank you so much for your thoughts and giving us the experience of how you are doing uh, for your com for your people. And just before I let you go, um, how do you think we can help you uh, as part of the international? Uh, solidarity. Thank you so much. I think the biggest issue, Carson, that we are facing is climate change and the rising sea level. So I think if our brothers and sisters from New Zealand and Australia, which is, we call them our, our neighbor, our tuakoi, our nearby uh, neighbors or our big brothers, I think that there's, we have a lot to work uh, together with our New Zealand and Australian colleagues. Because in the global scene, for example, Fiji been offering the uh, their land for there's a piece of land being offered by the Fijian government for Tuvaluans, but the uh, previous government government continued to turn it down that offer, and for that very reason, because this offer is being done through political level, but it needs to be comes from the indigenous people of Fiji. So that's what I mean when we, when we discuss the issue of transboundaries and crossing borders, we also need to have some collaborations with the uh, natives, the, um, the Aboriginal people of the land, the natives. How, how are we being welcomed by them? We can be welcomed by a uh, political level. We can be welcomed by political decisions but we are not being welcomed by the native peoples, the landowners, the people who owns the land. So I think two, two things that need to be considered at this point. First, we should uh, advocate at the political level to get a political will. And secondly, we also need to do some work with our local communities. I mean, the um, indigenous community in New Zealand and also here in Australia, of how best we can work together. I will welcome if worse comes to worse and we have no options, but relocation is the only options in front of us. Our other people of New Zealand, the Maoris and the Aborigines or uh, Aboriginal people of Australia, uh, will they welcome us as their brothers and sisters or are we just being welcomed by this political phenomenon of accepting getting our visa and passport, getting that, 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 that authorization to cross borders. But I think the issue is the, it's not just crossing borders, it's how best we can be welcomed by the native people of the land. So those are a few things, Akash, and I think that we need, while I'm here in Sydney, I'm only studying here, I'm not staying here. I'm only studying here, so I'm also trying to reach out to some of my, um, fellow indigenous uh, Australians of how best we can, we can work this out while I'm still here, just to generate the conversation. Because basically we don't want to live to Balu Ghazali. It's, I think it's the best peaceful island in the world. Corona free, COVID free, and it's slow. You don't need to pay any insurance. You don't need to pay any rent. It's just 
is paradise, is heaven. But if worse comes to worse, we have to have option B. We can't just rely on a political um, discussion that's going on. But we need to have a plan B at least. If worse comes to worse and we have to, to leave the island, at least we have an option. So this is something that indigenous people around the globe should also look into it. The mass relocation of people and so forth. Shall I stop there? Well, thank you so much, Marina, and thank you for your passionate appeal and um, thoughts. And I've learned a lot as well about your people and the challenges and um, the real-time climate action and seeing you, knowing that you're already going through. I think that is what I've heard a lot. And yeah, so... Thank you so much. I'm going to, uh, I'm going quickly to Roka, but before that, um, yeah, let me just ask Roka first before I go to a few, uh, a few questions. Uh, Roka, uh, welcome to uh, the webinar today and on how to indigenous now. And first things first, um, what are your thoughts on his participation so far? Yeah, hi, Manasu Muraka. Hello, everybody. Sorry, I was late. We have like emergency situation in the last uh, two days here. One of our leaders are being arrested. Uh, actually, it's not being arrested, like being kidnapped, but openly by uh, police uh, uh, groups. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking about participation. I think uh, participations at um, all levels. It's it's all about representative, the voice and legitimacy. So what I'm thinking around now, because I, this is from my experience, because once, once we don't show legitimacy, or once we don't show uh, that our representative at any Ruka. UN meeting, yeah? Ruka, would like to ask you a question. Um, what yeah. happened? Huh. Yeah, what, what happened? You, you talked about legitimacy. Yeah, I'm talking about legitimacy. So I think, how do we, how do we make sure that uh, all our representatives at EU and uh, forum, uh, whoever they are, what, uh, wherever they are, uh, will, will have that very strong backup uh, support. Uh, and that's the source of the legitimacy. Because we all know that they, when they go to negotiations or when they go to the talk, people, I mean, our, our, a, our government will always question them. Who are you? Who are you representing? How do you, you know? And then they will also play the other way around, coming around and asking us, do you know this person? Do you, do you agree with what they say? Uh, what do you think? And, you know, we will, we will spend our limited time just to, you know, just to respond and cope with them. So I think what is very important is I do think our caucus system now is not enough, yeah? We have to go beyond that. We should build a mechanism. How do we get the voice, the aspirations of people like me, or like um, as, as Maina mentioned earlier, our sisters and brothers who are uh, difficult uh, to reach uh, UN, yeah, to go into the UN forum, but we have to make sure that the voice are also being represented in that. In that. So it's like, it's like bring, bring out the quality uh, aspirations of indigenous peoples. At the same time, we build, we strengthen the legitimacy of our diplomats. I will, I will always call uh, all of you our diplomats. Uh, because for example, us in Indonesia um, and also many other indigenous peoples uh, in, in Asia, we don't speak the language. Even our national language is our third or second language. Yeah, me, I only speak, I only learned to speak English when I was 30 years old. Yeah, it's only about 17 years ago and I'm still learning. And we always have that difficulty. So we don't, uh, uh, language don't take it for granted because we really, we really struggling with that. Nonetheless to say about the um, uh, geography, uh, our remoteness, yeah. And also our, a, our daily life uh, situation doesn't really give us 
enough time to think about something beyond our community. So that's that's these are the these are the uh, uh, these are the the things, the factor, the elements that we need to think. How do we build up that? And I think what we have now is we can reach out through emails, but how do we really make sure that, especially what we call subnational uh, mechanisms among indigenous groups, among indigenous peoples, has to be also established. Uh, and I think that's because it's also, we cannot have everybody, uh, all indigenous go to the UN system. It's going to be very expensive. And also of the knowledge is not fair. It's really unfair to push all indigenous people have to go to the UN because it's, 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 it's the alien world and we cannot push them or any of our elders who, who come to the UN and then you will, you will expect them to already negotiate with government. It is just not fair. It is not the reality. So I think that's why we need to have very skillful and legitimate, uh, legitimate nego uh, negotiator and our diplomats. I think that's that's uh, from me. I'm thinking. Um, that's what playing around my mind now. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Roka. And before I let you go, um, sorry, I should have asked uh, clearly about um, the issue that just happened. Uh, please tell us about your leader who has just been arrested, and uh, we're in solidarity and sorry. Um, how can we help? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. thank you so much. This is um, the situations now in Indonesia um, in the middle of this whole crisis, this virus. Uh, we are facing more and more a, the existing um, land grabbings. It's actually the government, the company, they are uh, taking the chance. They're using the, the uh, pandemic to being more aggressive. So one of our indigenous community who've been fighting for a 25, since 2005 until now, they've been fighting and their, their, their territorial is, territory is getting shrinking and shrinking and smaller, but the company uh, doesn't stop. And finally they started the criminalization because we all know that criminalization is just one phase of of a land grabbing. So they really targeting the leaders of the community one by one. And yesterday was the, the top leader that they arrested. So we have like national outcry and uh, but luckily, thank goodness, uh, all we get all this like 100,000 supports from uh, across the country. And the police officer, they have no idea. They have no other clue but to release him. So he was released yesterday, thank goodness. But we are proceeding with the legal case because there are many procedures, uh, legal procedures that they uh, breach. So we are going to, now we are head hunting them. So they, they, they will have to watch very carefully. So I think, and thank you very much. Um, uh, the, me in Jakarta, I'm completely fine. Uh, but our community, our leaders are on the ground. And this is, if you know Mina, this is in Mina's island in Kalimantan, in Borneo. And all of our uh, leaders now, they are being terrorized. They are being asked to make an official statement that will go against our community, our own organization. So this has been going on. So that's why we're like holding uh, holding on, holding on. We we need to uh, we need to concentrate and we need to focus. So, but thank you very much, uh, Carson, for asking for that. And we really need, uh, yeah, of course, support and prayers from uh, our indigenous sisters and brothers uh, everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and we wish you well. Uh, definitely our brothers and sisters, all relations and our support system are listening right now. And we know what, we know what to do. Um, thank you, Roka. Uh, we'll ask the next question. And this goes out to everyone. Uh, Una, Devashesh, Claire, and everyone, I have a question for you. How far have uh, states come in terms of understanding the rights of indigenous peoples 
uh, since the adoption of the declaration. Uh, that is in your own context, by the way, uh, or generally. Uh, and in your view, what are some of the things that the states are understanding well and uh, some of the things that um, most of the, I mean, some of the things that the state misunderstand and most about the rights of the indigenous peoples, what can we do about it? Um, who will shoot first? <laughs> Good, Raja, please. Uh, thanks. Well, uh, with regard to states implementing the UN Declaration, uh, in Bangladesh is a sorry state. Um, I, I, just to add on to what Ruka is saying, many of my colleagues, friends, indigenous, who used to go to the permanent forum and MRIP are now hiding because they will, they fear, or they have false criminal charges against them. So we are, we're a very highly militarized region in the Chittagong Hill tracks now. And so we, the people who can speak are getting fewer and fewer because of our state is becoming a more, uh, well, no adjectives. Uh, and uh, for example, as an indigenous chief, I have been using the term indigenous peoples. When, when I have the authority to give residential certificates, which allow people to buy land or get a job of, of a region. And I used the ter English term indigenous. And the, min the ministry concerned asked me, chief, you cannot do that because the constitution of Bangladesh does not uh, contain the word indigenous. And I said, look at the British time legislation, which uses the English word indigenous, and Bangladesh time legislation, which is the vernacular term for indigenous, Adivasi, like in India. And I said, I'm just following the law. If you want to change the law, you, you change the law. But so you cannot call yourself indigenous. This is a change of the Bangladesh government in the last uh, seven, eight years. Whereas earlier on, uh, uh, to, to Kobo, who did that study, they said, we have uh, my people living here since time immemorial on the banks of the river Kannafuli. So anyway, so what I'm saying is that this is a states like, well, we all know Bangladesh is a leader, Bangladesh, India, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, they keep on uh, sometimes Thailand. I don't know. They keep on saying either we have no indigenous or we're all indigenous. So they have a, but our, but sometimes in South Asia, what we say is all right. You know, apart from Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, India, Bangladesh have ratified either 169 Nepal or 107 ILO convention. Then, okay. All right. Then when you ratify these instruments, did you say we have no indigenous, only tribal? Uh, indigenous is only in uh, New Zealand, Australia, and the Americas, and Africa and Asia is only tribal. But it, but current international human rights law does not distinguish between indigenous and tribal, although that remains in the FAO policy and the ILO convention. So it's, it's a very oppressive and stifling situation that we are facing in Bangladesh, in India, the Nagas, I joined a webinar and they are negotiating self-determination. They want their own flag. And well, the, the moral, uh, the, 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 uh, in Mindanao, uh, they, 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 they have been given their own national anthem. They can have their own national anthem. They just have to play it after the Philippine national anthem. What's a flag? What's a national anthem? There are some North Americans who used to visit Geneva and other parts carrying their own passports and not the national passport. Somebody referred to this. So, but anyway, so states are being uh, playing into the hands of civil and military bureaucrats. And, uh, and also there's a resurgence of populism. You see it from Philippines right down to uh, our, our South Asia, Southeast Asia, Thailand, look at the, and um, uh, uh, Myanmar. Uh, so, I don't know, we are in a very bad situation now with regard to implementing the UN declaration at the, at the country level, at the local level. And one of the only things we can hold on to, and I believe we should, is the SDGs. 
when you really stretch the SDGs uh, in, in, in so many ways, you can get not all of the declaration, but some very meaty chunks of the declaration by calling it a sustainable development goal or target. And so I think that's one of the few things that we latch onto as we drown, like a, you know, you a glass at a straw and try to redefine many of those political and civil rights in the language of SDG, but of course not everything can be an SDG. Rights are still rights apart from development. But anyway, so I think it's a challenge that we face in different parts of the world. We are facing in Bangladesh, in the plains regions of Bangladesh, even worse than the Chittagong tracks. But here too, we are dealing with uh, uh, food insecurity, uh, health and security, even our ordinary people can't go to the hospitals, etc., because of COVID, and our, our lands are being grabbed. So I think I'll stop there. It took a long time. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. Uh, for, thank you so much. I'll come back to, for this question to all of you. But before that, I think Claire would like to say something and then leave uh, for uh, somewhere else. Please, Claire. Thank you so much, Carson. And I'm not leaving anywhere else. I just have little people to um, put to bed. It's quite late here in, in New Zealand and I've exhausted their patience, um, unfortunately. Um, but I just wanted to um, thank everybody for, for and Ghazali um, particularly, um, and, and you too, Carson, for, for organising and, and running this event. Um, I also wanted to pick up on some of the points just that Dev has um, been, been addressing, which are in, in, in to some level uh, focused on what's happening, particularly now in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Um, and it just um, reminds me, Dev, that, that some of the importance of, of the, the international movement is not so much, um, well, is only in part about what you can achieve at the international level and the relevance um, of what's happening internationally to what's happening domestically, but is also um, the importance of the movement and support for one another um, and um, support for, um, for example, um, those of our uh, sisters and brothers who um, need it at particular times. So, so with the Chittagong Hill Tracks now and, and um, thinking also of, of the comments made by Mina about um, Tuvalu as well, and that the movement itself, beyond what's happening at a legal or political level, that the indigenous self, um, has a great deal of um, worth and value and solidarity um, for, for one another. So I just, it just occurred to me then, Dev, um, that as we wax and wane in, in, in different periods and times with, with governments and state issues and local issues and international issues, but the movement is always there um, to support one another. So it's just, just I think, opportune to point that out. Um, just also, I wanted to, to, that one of the first questions or, or the questions we were, we were asked when, um, to, to mention at the, begin, at the beginning um, or addressed at the beginning was um, what are some of the things that we're working on at the moment. I think in Aotearoa, New Zealand, um, there are lots and lots and lots of issues to work on. But for me personally, I think the big one is fundamental constitutional change. Um, and because I think that all the tweaks, the tweaking to the current system or um, using existing mechanisms that we have um, in place are not enough. And I think there does need to be this sort of trans transformative shift, um, which would require constitutional change. So, and that includes greater recognition also for um, customary law. Crossing back then to the international level, the participation and the recognition of um, sovereignty and authority of indigenous peoples domestically, um, and that relationship is very important then, I, th I think, um, for us too. So I just wanted to leave on those, on those comments, but really just reflecting on the, the value of the movement and of us um, as Indigenous peoples um, um, being together, working together and supporting one another in all the various different ways in, in which um, our lives change and our needs change and our political context change. So kia ora everybody, um, have a great afternoon or morning or, or whatever it is, I'm going to bed. <laughs> thank you, I'm putting my kids to bed. <laughs> but thank you all and thanks for the opportunity.
thank you. Thank Bye, Claire. Thank you, all the best. Bye, thank you. Bye. And to the whole family. Bye bye, Claire. Bye bye. 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 Okay. Uh, good. Uh, so, uh, good. Uh, anyone else would like to, any of our panelists would like to wrap up on that question before we move um, to. What was the, the question one? again, uh, Carson? Good. Uh, thank you, Gasale. Uh, let me go back and read again. Um, the question was, like how far um, have we, uh, I mean, how far have the states come in terms of uh, understanding um, the rights of indigenous people since the adoption of the declaration in your own context or general? Um, and in your view, um, in your view, what are some of the, uh, what are some of the things that the states are understanding well and some of those that they are misunderstanding uh, mostly about the rights of indigenous people and what can be done about that um, um anyone would like to go yeah, Carson, yes, yes, if, I, if i may um yes please i, I think i think i think i think what what uh, claire and devish touched upon is one of the definitely the the, the strengths that in in my view of the movement uh one is of, of course spirituality like um uh, we we do not travel without our ancestors that's for one and the second one is solidarity. And I think that's like what you, uh, with uh, the, the situation in Chittagong Hill Tracts, uh, situation that Ruka is uh, dealing with right now, like it only, uh, and the first thing that you ask like, is like, how can we help? You know, I think, and that is one of the true strengths of the International Indian People's Movement. Um, to, to answer your question about, uh, uh, about like what states are understanding and what um, misunderstanding, um, it is very difficult, um, and adding to what uh, Dev and uh, Claire said, it's very difficult to, to say like, this is what they get and this is what they don't get, um, because it's very contextual. Uh, for example, if you talk to states that are, are have a quote unquote close relationship with indigenous peoples, um, say for example, Canada, um, and I'm saying quote unquote, because I, I know it's still iffy of course, uh, you, you see that their not level of knowledge about indigenous peoples and the rights of indigenous peoples is uh, much uh, yeah, more evolved than, for example, if you would talk to other other uh, other states. And this, this is just like in general um, terms, because um, if you go like really contextual uh, Maluku case or Indonesia or Pacific, like I, like for example, Indonesia, I'll better off handing that off to to Ruka and and and, and Huna. Um, so. I think one of the things that states that do not have a, a, a good understanding about Indian rights, and these are mostly the people that have a, a, a not have a good understanding of Indian rights. Because if you go to Geneva or New York, um, you have uh, people from third committee or the human rights council, and they have a fair understanding of the rights of Indian peoples. Um, they have been dealing with the declaration um, since Indian peoples have been participating. But once you go to um, CBD, so that's the Convention on Biological Diversity or the UNFCCC, which is the Climate Change Convention, like it shifts. Uh, you see that like, you're not dealing with diplomats or negotiators, you're dealing then with experts uh, or not experts. Uh, you, you're dealing with uh, people that have uh, knowledge of environmental law uh, and, and, th and those things. Um, so that is uh, so, so that that is a, a difficulty that we we uh, have to have to deal with. Um, so also the national context. Um, so Indigenous peoples, like I said, uh, if you talk to a negotiator or a representative from Canada, like they have a, quite a good understanding of rights. If you go talk to France, for example, uh, the country of France, like they're the totally opposite. Um, they don't believe in collective rights. That's what a representative of France has, has told me. And that is, has historically been that way. Because uh, France, like it only, what I knew was the king and its, um, and its people. There was nothing in between. There were no communities, there were no peoples in between. So like collective rights, if you want to talk about collective rights with France, like, it's very difficult for them to understand. And also what, what is challenging is that um, 
uh, it has been said before that the United Nations is very siloed. Um, it's very compartmentalized. Uh, you have, like I said, you have uh, uh, countries, representatives that, that, that are uh, based in New York, based in some of them, uh, you have some, we have, you have countries that are based in Geneva, based in Bonn, based in Nairobi, based in Rome, and they all, they are countries, but then again, they all have their own plan of action, their own, have their own way. So we as Indian peoples, we like the wide angle lens. Uh, we are the ones that have to look at things from a 30,000 feet view by saying, oh, by the way, uh, about Indian rights, uh, when you're in Bonn, this is what your country has said in New York. Because uh, a lot of the times there's no communication or little to no communication between the countries when it comes to the rights of Indian peoples. So it is, uh, so those are, the, are like the challenges that, that we can face, uh, are facing uh, um, at a, I would almost say at a, at a daily basis when, when we engage with, with uh, young countries. Um, if you talk about like good things that, that, are, that are happening, um, uh, there, 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 there's, there's some, uh, like, for example, the declaration came from a partnership. Like, so more and more countries are starting to, to embrace the, the partnership that indigenous peoples want to have with, with, with states um, to fight the, the, these um, global issues like climate change, like loss of biodiversity, but also on very, very political issues like the NS participation process like that Thomas, Dev, and Claire, and, and, and um, uh, Jocelyn talked about. You know, so, so there's, there's this shift actually that, that's happening as well. Um, but like overarching, uh, like what I, what I said before, is it, the challenges, those are like the misunderstandings that, that we keep, that we have to keep on um, educating. Uh, we, yeah, it's, it's like, almost like we, every time we go to the UN, we have to educate them again, again, and again, and again, and again about and, and the rights of indigenous peoples. Because um, not only are we at 30,000 feet view, but also we are consistent. And these people's movement is consistently uh, participating, and we're dealing with states that have their experts and, and their their people that are on a rotational basis. So you deal with them uh, during while they're based in New York, but then again, like when, once they phase out and somebody else comes in, you have to like build that relationship back up again. And I think that's why what what Dev said uh, is something, and kind of said before uh, last week. Uh, what is something that we should definitely be looking into is like how can we make ensure that that permanent presence of indigenous peoples um that at the united nations not just when an emrip comes in on a permanent forum but like a permanent presence um based like an embassy mission whatever you want to call it um in new york geneva and, and so forth so those are just my, 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 my quick thoughts on, on the question that was, that was asked. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, brother. And we will, uh, yes, I'm converting you again. Oh, Thomas would like to say something. Please, Thomas. Thank you. I will try to be quite brief. Uh, regarding the question, I think that, um, the adaptation or, 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 or uh, the decision on, on, on the World Conference outcome document on, on the indigenous peoples is, is, is a good tool and also certain expression of the will in the world uh, and different countries what they are willing to do. And there the will of, of um, building these national action plans, how to implement the declaration is, is, is a tool and, and should be a form of expression uh, what is the will in the world currently. But um, I guess we all have seen um, um, that there is, a, there is this uh, uh, will or, 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 or kind of, now let's say willingness to, to, to not, or not willingness to push the human rights more forward. Human rights un, are under attack. The, the countries in the world are, are considering that the current commitments are already uh, enough. Uh, in, in many cases, it seems to my eyes like that. 
so so from the general perspective um I, I think that is in kind of two ways. There is the commitment, there is the decision made, there is a little reservation by, by any member states on that specific paragraph that talks about the national action plans to implement the declaration. Um, but, but, but the climate is not currently nice for indigenous people's rights to be pushed forward. And they may be on a, on, on, on a kind of a personal level or, or our own context in, in the Sami case. Uh, even though we live in a country that has been champion for uh, human rights, like for example in Finland, uh, we still see uh, the, the difficulties to, to build the understanding in the national parliament uh, on, on, on the commitments that the government has made on international forums. So uh, we've been talking uh, quite many times on the two phases policies that uh, on the other hand on the international level you are pushing and, and committing your nation to to implement the rights but on the national level the political decision making bodies are not following that so i think that is that is the that, that is the challenge that we are we are facing Although there are more and more in-depth understanding in the governmental structures and ministries and the, the, the rights of indigenous peoples, um, still the understanding is quite narrow. It's many times focused on one ministry. The ministries sometimes don't or usually don't discuss that a lot. And, <coughs> and the national legislations are prepared in different kind of ministries. So. So there is a gap on understanding the commitments that have been made. There seems to be a certain kind of level of understanding of the rights in Finland, but, but there is a clear uh, lack of understanding the commitment of, that the government of Finland has done. And, and also um, maybe referring to the last week discussions on, on what is the situation generally, uh, where we now see that there are those countries that haven't been um, positive towards the development of indigenous people's rights, formalizing their cooperation in, 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 a, in a group and in a, in a, in a formal setting. So, so um, the, and what is sad in currently in the world, I think that, that the development of rights um, are being uh, pushed back strategically and in an organized way by country, especially in the, in the indigenous rights context. And, and that is a new, new kind of a challenge, what we are seeing in, 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 in the global kind of general level and how do, and what that, does that mean in, 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 in the future on the national levels is to be seen, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Jocelyn? Okay, so I would like to share something in the context of Taiwan. So I'm not so sure if uh, the audience of this webinar knows about that. We do have uh, a basic law of uh, the of the rights of indigenous peoples in Taiwan, which was adopted in 2005, uh, two years earlier than than the UN trip. But uh, the problem, that's why like a lot of people or even the Taiwanese government, they are always bragging about that. They are saying that we are more advanced um, than United Nations because we adopt this uh, basic law on the rights of indigenous peoples earlier than United Nations. And also a lot of concepts in this basic law, of course, is responding or very similar to what we have in the UN trip. But for me, as I, I, I saw this uh, basic law, of course, it's a, a, van, uh, um, a very important tool, legal tool that we can use to really, you know, claim our rights and also to demand a government to comply with all the articles. But on the other hand, it's also kind of hinder our um, ability of getting to know what is the real situation or how can we progress more 
on the legal framework because then now the Taiwanese government they will always say that uh, because in the articles of the basic law it only give uh, an idea or a principle so regarding how can we uh, practice or how can we implement the articles we need another law to tell us as a manual to tell us what to do and then at the end it will be interpreted as if we don't have a, a set of laws then we don't have this right because we don't know how to implement it so that's the, the situation we have now in Taiwan despite we have really good legal framework but then that became an excuse for the government of not doing things and the other thing is that from what I see or what I experience is in Taiwan we the practice of indigenous peoples are not really recognized as real government governance or a real political uh, decision making bodies or procedures that we have we are so limited to this concept of what is culture so the government they will just so easily categorize, categorize everything we do as culture of indigenous peoples to avoid the fact that all the practice we have all this cultural practice is actual governing it's actual diplomacy it's actual making alliance and also to negotiate to achieve uh, peace uh, to achieve agreement among different communities that's that's real politics but then it was not it's not recognized so that's another thing of how the government or the state is really understanding the rights of indigenous peoples in taiwan and the other thing is that what we do in taiwan especially regarding the the work of the government is always halfway i mean they have I would say, comparing to a lot of different states, the Taiwanese governments, they do have better understanding of in the rights of indigenous peoples and or the, the, the concept of human rights. But they just do, they just be very selective. And I would say sometimes very lazy. They just want to pick the things that's easier to do, or they just tend to, to, to ignore the, the real concept, the core, value of everything and just pick what is more it's easier for people to see for example when we are talking about indigenous diplomacy we are talking about to have our this bound this um this bound of taiwan indigenous peoples with the uh, the the islands on the Pacific, because we do have this bound of our blood link or our cultural practice. So we do have a lot of shared common, uh, shared points that we can really build up strong relationship with Pacific Islands. But then when it comes to the state um, practice, it only become like when the president, she was out in her visit to the Pacific Islands, she brought some indigenous uh, people with her, but to perform songs and dances instead of having indigenous peoples in the, I don't know, like the crew of to, to give advice to her. You know, this is something that we, it, it has been like this for decades, but it's not really improving that when we are talking about our political involvement, it stay really shallow. And also the other example is that in 2016, the president of Taiwan, she, she on behalf of the government, she made an official apology to the indigenous peoples in Taiwan. And one of the promise she made is to remove the uh, nuclear waste that is stored on this small island, it's indigenous island we have, it was there for more than 30 years. So she promised that it should be removed. But instead of really coming up uh, of a timetable of the removal, they announced a new saying that they are going to give a really big amount of money as compensation to this 
uh, wrong the government had did. But this is just not the point that we are talking about. I mean, the more money they are claiming to give, the more discriminations, the more criticized we will get from the mainstream society because they will think we just want money. We just want, I don't know, some certain position in the government, but that's not the, the point. It's more important of how to deal with things in the way that we really want. It's not about how it's easier for the government to provide or to offer or to even grant to the indigenous peoples. And the final point I would like to make is that, as I mentioned, that we cannot really officially participate in the United Nations process, not only in the, uh, the meetings, but also, for example, like all the different kinds of reviews, different kinds of um, like the, the peri periodic uh, review of different international instruments. But in Taiwan, we do come up with our own version of the uh, covenant reviews that we invite uh, people, experts from different countries, and some of them are like retired experts from the United Nations to come to Taiwan. We just you know have our own version of all these country reports and reviews and all these things. But even though that's our own version, but I would say that in terms of negotiate for us to have a more direct way to negotiate it and also to make the government understand what we are talking about and what we really wish they could do. It's a very good way because we don't have to, you know, uh, people, uh, the government somehow take us more seriously with this process. So I would say for, at least for the context in Taiwan, it will be very helpful if we can have something like this from the United Nations level to have a, I don't know, like a country, re country review on UN DRIP. So if there's something like this happening in the United Nations, we can lobby for the Taiwanese government to do a Taiwanese version in Taiwan with this. Then we will have a very direct channel to really talk to the government and tell them what's the meaning of UN DRIP. Otherwise, when we are talking about UN DRIP in Taiwan, the government a lot of time will be the Council of Indigenous Peoples, which is the highest uh, government agency within the whole government system in Taiwan regarding indigenous peoples. They will always say that we already have the right, the basic law of the rights of indigenous peoples. So we don't need to talk about UN trip because we already have something that is more advanced, which is not because in the basic law, it doesn't really recognize collect collective rights of indigenous peoples. So yeah, that's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, and thank you, everyone. I think we, uh, Thomas has left and I wanted to compliment uh, his background telling us about Aksambilan. It's a beautiful one. I wish he was here to, to see. And thank you, Jocelyn, for your thoughts. Wonderful. And because we extended, uh, we're going to extend to the next 10 minutes to close it up. And to all our panelists, I would like to throw in, uh, to throw it back to you for your last round of thoughts. Uh, as we end, as we wrap it up. So please, uh, Raja, I see you are ready. Thanks, Hosan. Um, I want to start off with the collective rights and then move on to how indigenous peoples and in countries which were formerly European colonies are sometimes getting the worst of the two, where Europe is now better than our national country, we still get the national country's bad thing, and where our country is actually better than the colonizer, but they keep on following the colonizer's notions, like collective rights. Um, I want to take this opportunity also to say one thing I have not had a chance to say, but I won't be long, which is 
customary rights, customary law. Uh, one of the many examples of collective rights. Uh, customary law, well, in, in the Indonesian example is Masyarakat Adat. That's how the rest of the Indonesians recognize indigenous peoples. And I, I think this is one of the things that distinguish indigenous peoples most, not all, from other people, but it's also one of the things, the few tools they have in which they are sovereign. The president, the prime minister, and the parliament, and the chief justice and courts do not find customary law. Customary law is per se, by its own definition, law made by the people, by the community without having a parliament and a president and a prime minister and speaker. Now, this collectivized thing that France is saying, those of you here, apart from English, I don't know, you, some of you people may speak European languages. I tried to say in English, in my language, I can say that this land belonged to the Ghazalis, that means this land belongs to Ghazali and a few other individuals, groups, entities. Try and say it in English. I cannot. I have to say this land belongs to Ghazali and a few other individuals, groups, entities, etc. And more English language, perhaps Spanish, French, German, Italian, they have lost the ability to define land as being owned by any other person because of capitalism, individualism, which grew from, I don't know, Industrial Revolution, UK, and all that. And then they have left their bad legacy in Asia and Africa, where our governments are following not what the Dutch are doing now, what the Dutch did 200 years ago, Dutch, British, Portuguese, uh, Spanish, etc., French. But why should we say there are, there, are, there, are, there are no collective rights? There have been collective rights for centuries in all all countries of Asia, all countries of Africa, all countries of uh, South America and Central America, and the Sami and part of the Greenland and Tundra and, and, and Siberia and the East. Of course we have it. So I think part of our struggle is not just against those civil and military bureaucrats. South Asia uh, is a very good example. Southeast Asia, Burma, Bangladesh, India, Nepal, they forgot about all those indigenous people's rights and, and agreements that they signed and they're not uh, owning up. But we have to also, I think, join the greater democracy movement of the non-indigenous peoples of our countries where they too are being cheated. It doesn't mean that in every movement we'll be the same with them. Our, we have certain things which are different from the, from the non-indigenous, but in some things we have some commonalities for example, the women's movement, in the peasants' movement, and a few other movements. And I think it makes sense both as a matter of principle and as a matter of strategy to align ourselves with progressive uh, 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 sections of the non-indigenous citizens of our countries to try to decolonize our national constitutions, which still smack of European colonialism of 200 years ago. Europe has changed, our national governments have not. And all those bureaucrats, and that's what they throw at us, apart from, as Ghazali mentioned, in the CBD, things are a little different. And uh, I think uh, and, uh, in the uh, 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 development, some of the other development processes, and I don't know, other uh, climate change is complex, ozone treaties, etc. but still, they're a little bit, as you said, experts rather than bureaucrats. But we have to try to not let the bureaucrats get off and nor the politicians who just speak rhetoric and try to win alliances within the mainstream where there are progressive politics, environmentalists, women's rights activists are there and see if you can throw some win-win agendas across where, so that we can also win a few battles at the national and local levels, as well as at the international levels, but as Claire Charters, my good friend, said before she left, you also go to the international levels also so that you can bring the pressure to 
help implement your rights at the local and national levels as well. But anyway, so I'll stop there. Uh, Carson, thank you so much. My best to Melanie who couldn't come today. Uh, thanks to Ghazali as always. Uh, keep on with this and it's really inspiring to have our friends, uh, Jocelyn and many others who left to Omas, etc. Uh, great to be with you guys. Keep it up. Thanks so much. Ju. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raja. Uh, what, because we don't have much time, we will go straight to our next panelist to wrap it up. Uh, Ruka and then Maina and Fiona. Uh, and then, sorry, Jocelyn. Ruka, Jocelyn, Maina, and Huna. Please, uh, Ruka. One minute, actually, just like in one minute. Yeah, thank you. I'm. I would like to make, make comments about rights of determination, as we mentioned, uh, we discussed earlier. Our government will never understand. And not that they understand. Sorry, sorry. They will always say they don't understand. Uh, and others, like private company also, they will always say, I don't understand. I don't get it. Explain more to me. So, but I think not they don't want to, they don't understand, but they pretend they don't understand. Yeah, I think I, they pretend because that status quo for them is the best way to, you know, to get away with the responsibility and all these things uh, a state can uh, have to do. So what is, I think what is the most important thing is we start to, uh, exercise our rights to self-determination at a very small level, which is at community level. Because that's, that's the reality. That's the reality. And when we start uh, to have already the practices and we show them, this is what self-determination means. I don't, I don't, I don't uh, understand if you say you don't understand. And I don't care if you say you cannot understand, but you have seen it. And that's what we want. Uh, you, you want. We want you to recognize. And this kind of attitude I've seen in the history of indigenous people struggles in Indonesia, that's what it works. Because, because once we already go to them and ask for recognition, we already lowering our, ourselves ahead of, uh, before them. We already compromise because the language, and that's what, that's, I mean, to be honest, I hate what people always say, common ground or middle ground, uh, you know, where, where two sides can meet together. We, in most cases, are the losing end, yeah, on the losing side. So I think for me, it's not matter because according to international law, according to uh, human rights law, it doesn't matter they recognize me legally, what matters is my permanent sovereignty over my territory. So I think that is, that's kind of us attitude also because we are like chasing, chasing them all the time and they come and like, okay, and then they will go away again and then we start again. I mean, every, every time like we start from zero. So for me, from now, we need to exercise by ourselves, at least at our community level. And then they will follow us. You know, in the end, they have no option, yeah? We will corner them by leading by, by example. So I think that's from me, and thank you very much, uh, Gasali again, uh, and Carson, and Ju, Raja Devasis, say hi to everybody, and also uh, to Taiwan. Thank you very much. Lovely to thank hear you, you Ruka. Keep well. All best to the friends of Aman and everybody. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Jocelyn and Maina and Huna, please. Jocelyn. Okay. Thank you, Carson. So in I would one, like in, to... In, in one. <laughs> okay. In just less than a minute. Less than yeah, a minute. Okay. <laughs> what I would like to wrap up with is to come back to the first sentence that we had to finish at the beginning of this webinar saying that why we're doing all these things. I said that I because I don't want the next generation well, they have to be, they, they will have to suffer, suffer from the same issues that we are facing now. And uh, I just want to add to that because, you know, as the youth caucus, global indigenous youth caucus in the past, we 
uh, work a lot on the recognition of indigenous youth to be seen as experts within the United Nations. And we made it. And, and of course, it's not only the youth caucus, it's like a lot of people who were devoting in this process. And now like indigenous, indigenous youth and also youth in general are recognized as experts in the United Nations. And that's something I we have to do back home. I mean, in Taiwan, we are facing the same thing that we are not recognized as experts. In Taiwan, if you want to be recognized as experts, you need to be in a high position in the government, or you have to be a professor. You have to have a doctor degree, so then you can be recognized as an expert. And that's so wrong, even though because of that, I'm doing my PhD now because I want to, I, I, I want to have more space to, to be really be able to Love talk to all my God. But, uh, I see you. My father uh, said, get your PhD and I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> but that's wrong, you know? I know this is so wrong. So we have to change that shit. That's, oh, sorry about my language. But anyway, what I want to say is that's what I meant at first, that I really hope with all the efforts that we made, and we did have some progress internationally, regionally, and back home we have to in taiwan we have to have that progress as well that indigenous peoples we will be recognized as experts just because we are indigenous people it's not because we are indigenous professor or we are indigenous politician thank you thank you thank you jocelyn uh, Maina, please Well, thank you, um, Carson. Uh, and definitely, yes, as, uh, as I said earlier in, um, in my discussion, is that what keeps me going is the fact that we need to keep our community survive. We need our community to be um, recognized in terms of their, their rights and, and also the, the decision that has been made within the, uh, the Falakau Pule or within their traditional meeting house which needs to be uphold all the time. So, I mean, as I said, when worse come to worse, we need to be very strategic in what we do. So it's not just an issue of advocacy, but it's an issue of, um, of strategy. We really need to, to find our way in and out. What is our entry point? How do we um, take this forth to be discussed by the United Nations. Say, for example, the issue of uh, uh, of, of relocation and um, and displacement. You know, it's something that is difficult to comprehend, especially when it comes to UN processes, because of the fact that you know climate change is not really um, recognized wholly within the system of uh, of people being trans uh, boundaries. So those are the few, uh, you know, it, it has to do with legal issues, but it's, you know, there is no harm in, in, in bringing the issue into the uh, forefront. As we also advoc advocate for, for it in, in Geneva, you know, how best we can use the AMRIP, the, um, the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous people to address the issue of climate change. You know, not just the issue of uh, indigenous rights as it is now, but how we can incorporate the issue of people being displaced or forced migration because of, uh, because of, uh, of climate change. You know, they're being forced against their will to, 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 to another place. But all in all, it's something that um, we're working on to ensure that uh, our government will definitely uh, endorse or ratify the UN drip. You know, there's, I think there is no complication on that issue, but uh, I'll definitely um, keep on pushing. At least we can have that ready at the end of this year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Una, Una, please. 
Okay, thank you so much, Carson, and uh, thank you for everyone. Um, I have a, a Iburuka here. She's my uh, leader for the indigenous peoples here in Indonesia. I'm from Maluku. And so what I said before is um, I, I, I want to do because of my uh, uh, next generation. And uh, we're talking about solar, uh, solar uh, what's, what's called before? Solidaritas, solidarity is important for us here in Maluku. We need that to working together to understand what the government uh, uh, mission, uh, politic is going right now. So important as uh, important things that we uh, looking for is uh, like uh, uh, Ruka said, uh, the uh, uh, legitimacy, legitimate. And so when we, uh, uh, our voice can hear by uh, strong uh, in, in background, I mean, it's like, like me here in Maluku, oh, uh, I cannot do anything because I'm a young woman and I'm not a, like a doctor or a professor or no. So that is, uh, uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, collaboration uh, uh, mind and work with uh, uh, Iburuka so we can see what's going on here uh, with our government in uh, Indonesia and also for as, uh, especially in my uh, community in Maluku. So thank you. Thank you so much Huna and now my brother Ghazali um, as one of our precious panelists today Please give us your uh, final thoughts, and then we're going to wrap it up. Oh, um, I felt like everyone has pretty much uh, said what they wanted to say. Um, I think my my final, final, final thoughts will be in uh, the final episode, I guess, uh, at the end of it. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> um, I don't, I don't, so I'll probably save that for that uh, for um, next week. Just just a kind of kind of things that like. Um, when I when you when you ask like why I do what I do, um, and empowerment and inspiration is very important to me, and being able to amplify that. Um, first of all, like I very much second what, what Ruka said. Um, it is very important that we act self determined, that we act sovereign at the international level. If we don't do it, nobody will recognize us for it. Um, so that's the first thing that we have to do um, is um, you have to act like. Uh, we we are sovereign like that that we are we are self determined peoples, so it is very important that we act like it as well. Um, and from my experience at the international level, um, everything is a negotiation. Um, so you always have to aim high. Uh, you always have to like start off with acting acting sovereign. And I don't like I I well sorry I I I. Um, echo what, what Ruka said, like uh, that, that we don't, I don't like either the like common ground balance and everything else um, that we use a lot at the international level. Um, mostly because it is uh, on, we are actually descending to a level that they would like us to. And where, where it, is, it is always very important that we um, yeah, aim for a high standard. Um, rights, uh, rights of Indigenous peoples is a high standard. Ethics is a high standard. We should always aim for that. And all to 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 uh, to echo to underline what what what, what my sister Huna said. I well, I I do not um, go against it um, because um, yeah. Well, she is one of the, our, our leaders, if not the leader, uh, for, for the Muluku movement. And uh, in terms of Jocelyn, sis, seriously, um, you're an expert. You don't need a PhD for that. Uh, look, look at uh, Francisco Cali, the special rapporteur. He said it uh, himself uh, best, you know, like you don't have to be a uh, PhD. Uh, you do need to have a PhD to be recognized as, a, as an expert. We're all experts in our own rights. Um, we are indigenous, um, so that makes us an ex ex expert. That's an L, everything else is, is a plus, is a bonus. At least my, my, my two cents, my point of view. Um, 
love you guys as always uh, for for being with us uh for being who you are as well, and 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 sharing your thoughts i see carson already like all right wrap it up now so i will <laughs> um so um I, I was, of course i sorry that uh, melanie could not join us um she had some difficulties with the uh with, with the computer but uh hopefully um well she's been joining uh watching over facebook so that's good um megan could not join us because We've been talking about. Uh, she just uh, sent me a text that uh, her her call on constitutional recognition went into overtime. So hopefully, no, no, not hopefully. Um, I am going to try to push her to be on next week. Like uh, she missed out on this one, so definitely she has to, has to come back uh, next week. Um, yeah, to 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 join us because uh, she has a lot of things to to share. And when it comes to national recognition, cons sorry, constitutional recognition, and I think that is a theme that's throughout the series. Um, like I see her as, as one uh, one of the experts, um, so she can definitely have so some shed some lights on it uh, for all of us to, um, yeah, be uh, consuming that as as like what I call brain candy. Um, so yeah, sorry, Carson, no no personal point of view, uh, just some reflections. Uh, thank you. Good. Nice shirt, by the way. Love it. Really love it. And um, uh, yeah, well, I, I think you'll, you'll get my final remarks uh, next week if, you, if you're okay with that. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. Uh, despite the mishaps that I had in the beginning as well, I'm really glad. Hey, that hey, 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 hey. Don't, don't call it missteps. Don't call it missteps. You're fine. It, you're good. My... Let me just let everyone know, my laptop just crashed when I was about to begin. <laughs> so um, I want to thank all our guests for this roundtable episode for how to Indigenous now, um, how to Indigenous governance and diplomacy for the now webinar series. And if you are watching this from Zoom or Facebook, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we thank the interpreters for their amazing support, the guests for having shared their thoughts and time and the partners in this uh, special series. To, uh, Thomas Aslak, Juzo, Dose, the Drumbit Media, and TV Indigna. Uh, the last episode will be September 4th, and we are going to, uh, we're going back to 2 p.m. Geneva time. That's midnight Auckland time, 10 p.m. in Sydney, and 8 a.m. in Nairobi. It's going to be 3 p.m. in Nairobi. <laughs> and uh, it's going to end on a shower as well at 7 a.m. in Panama City. Please help us keep the conversation going on Twitter, hashtag how to indigenous now, and you can tag Ghazali in your post at Go Maluku. Uh, feel free to share any questions, screenshots, or feedback. Thank you for watching. Thank you, friends, and um, about this webinar series, and we hope to see you on September 4th. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much. All the best.